Methodist pastor and Sister Barnett are out of town in Arkansas. <clears throat> so pastor was asked that I do the Bible study tonight. Amen. So I always enjoy doing that. So here we are. Amen. And I promise you I will have you out by 8.30. Promise. Maybe even 8 o'clock. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. Just all depends on how this all goes. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. And I am just so thankful for all that he has done. I asked Sister Ginger to find a video clip. And uh, you want to go ahead and do that now? And then I'll do mine after. Amen. I think the way we pray is, it, prayer, is a, prayer is a powerful thing. But I think it's when you grow up in church, it's just you hear prayers all the time in different styles and stuff. And little quirks that people have when they pray. I don't know. Little phrases that I don't understand to this day. But we use the phrases, but we, we, that's just what we heard growing up. We think that's just the right thing to say when we pray. You know, like hedge of protection. You ever hear that? I hear that a lot. Hedge of protection. Damn, we are praying a hedge of protection around you, buddy. That's right, a hedge. Mm -hmm. Around you and your whole family. A hedge, huh? I don't mean to complain. Is that the best you can do? How about a thick cement wall? Around, with some razor wire on top of that bad boy. Hedge you protect a good set of clippers, get right through that thing. I'm sure the devil's got a set of those. I mean, you think a hedge is going to scare the devil away? What is this greenery? I can't get through that. Move that bush. My greatest weakness is landscaping. How did they know? That's how the devil walks, like this. Whoa. He has a pointy tail. He doesn't want to step on his tail. And he talks like a game show host. Fantastic. You get the turtle wax. <laughs> All right. I, uh had the privilege of seeing Tim Hawkins, Christian comedian. He has gotten a haircut since this was done. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> but anyhow, and he did do this skit. And uh, I remembered it after I felt God leading me to teach tonight on what I felt to teach on. And it happens to be a hedge of protection. And uh, it's not quite the way he makes it sound. You know, um, I guess maybe we need to call him up and say, here, come on in, sit down for Bible study. We will show you exactly what a hedge of protection can do. But uh, I do agree with him to a point. How often do we have statements and comments that we may not understand but because we've heard them we just repeat them and uh but tonight i would i would like to turn your attention to job the first chapter amen hope i can see out of my glasses just notice that time for There ain't no cleaner, I just rearranged the dirt. All right, well, we'll get by. All right, Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, I like that verse. Because it tells you a lot about who Job was. You know, we have all heard the story of Job. We've all heard how terrible his life got. Simply because God asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, I feel like I'm Job. Yet on the same token... 
nowhere near. Nowhere near as close. You know, I've, I've gone through some real rough times in my life. I've had my struggles. But then again, we all have. You know, we could sit here and, and uh, compare stories all night long. Oh, I had this happen to me and I had that happen. You know, kind of like the fishermen. You know, the first one says, I caught a fish the other day that was that big. And the next one said, well, I caught one, he was that big. They looked to the third guy and they said, how big was yours? He said, oh, it was about that big. And they all started laughing at him. He goes, yeah, about that big between the eyes. You know, I mean, we all can compare stories. And it seems like as we do compare stories, each one gets a little worse. Because we can't be outdone. We can't have somebody tell a story that's greater than our own. So, but when you start looking at the life of Job, you begin to see a life that took a downward spiral physically very quickly. And as we read verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. And one who feared God and shunned evil. You know, I kind of wonder, what would our world be like if Christians were more like Job? If we lived our lives in such a way that we could say that that Christian is blameless, upright, fearing God, and shunning evil. The problem is, in our lives today, we want to see how close we can get to the world without getting burned. We want to see how much like the world we can uh, can be, yet we want to say that I'm a Christian. But Job here, if we take a look at it and we see just what kind of a man he was. The next couple verses talks about his family, <coughs> excuse me, about his family and his wealth. And then starting in verse 4, this is just a little side note. But starting in verse 4, it says, And his sons would go on, uh, go and, and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters and eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them, the uh, number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. This is the side note. Job being the upright man, the righteous man, the man that, that feared God, covered his children in prayer. And I believe as parents, if you're a parent here today, and I see here the littlest one, the baby. The best thing as parents that we can do is to cover our children in prayer. Job made it a point to cover them regularly. He didn't do it once a year. He didn't do it when it was convenient. He didn't do it when he just kind of felt, uh, you know... They kind of seem to be getting a little out of hand. Maybe I better pray for them. But he did it regularly. But we go on to see in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? 
Verse 1 is pretty important, isn't it? Because God brings it to Satan's attention. And so in verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Have you made not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. You see, we find here in verse 10 that he says that God has placed a hedge, basically a hedge of protection around Job. He's given him protection. Why do you think God would put this hedge? And it was more than just a hedge that Satan could come up with the hedge clippers and clip out of the way and, and oh, I'm afraid of hedging, you know, greenery or landscaping. But you see, God had set a hedge of protection around Job's life and Satan couldn't get to him. As you would continue to read on in the scripture, you'll find that it's God saying, all right, I'm going to remove from Job this protection, but you can't take his life, you can't touch him. And then the next few verses, as you begin to read those verses, you begin to see, you know, a lot of times, I think when we read things, we read them in a way that suits us. But if you read the scripture here, one servant comes and begins to tell Job of all the things that he's lost. And in our minds, we might think, and then a week later, another servant comes and says, guess what? This has happened. But the scripture says... That as he was speaking, another servant came. And another servant came. And another servant came. And you see, as these servants would come, each one of them brought worse and worse news. You know, it's one thing to lose your animals. It's another thing to lose your crops. These were his wealth. These were the things that made him a wealthy man. But the last thing that we read about is how that his sons and his daughters were killed in their home. I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever had a day that bad. I've never had a day where I've lost my entire wealth, my entire, you know... Holdings of whatever sort, yeah, the, the stock market may have crashed and may have lost half of them, may have lost some of them, but I still got my health, I still have my children, but here Job lost everything, I mean everything. And you know, as you read on, you begin to realize all of the things that take place in his life. But after all of this has happened, we see in verse 20, it says that after he had received the last news about his children dying, we find that in verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. How many of us have ever gone through a hard time, have ever gone through a struggle, have ever lost everything, and still worshipped. You know, I know when I went through my struggles, still going through some, but I know when I went through some pretty major ones, at first, my, my first thought was not to worship God. My first thought was to question God. God, why? I don't understand this. God, you know, and then of course I have to tell him all the wonderful, great, marvelous things that I've done for his kingdom. 
You know, the truth of the matter is, Job had it right. In good times and in bad times, we need to worship God. And no, tonight is not another Bible study on prayer, although I do love to talk about prayer. I do love to talk about worshiping God. But when it comes up, I'm going to talk about it. We need to understand that in all things, we need to worship Him. You see, the thing that we need to understand is that this hedge that God had around Job, Satan could not cross. It was uncrossable. He didn't have the option to just walk in there and say, forget that and walk right across it. He had to have God's permission just to cross that hedge. I don't know what the hedge is. I know in the scripture, and we're going to take a look at what some of the hedges are. But, you know, the comedian, he, he wants to think it's a little piece of shrubbery. But I believe that the hedge is far more than that. You see, we, what we need to do, we need to trust in what God has done for us. We need to trust in his power. We need to trust in his protection. We need to trust in his provision. We need to trust in his purpose. You see, God has so much for us. But the problem is, is so often we're looking at the problems and we're not looking at what God has in store for us. You know, too often we're standing there pounding on the door that God has shut, trying to get it open, that we're missing the door that's wide open that he wants us to walk through. But Job, we find here, understood and followed after what God had for him to do. <coughs> and as we go on and read, we find then in chapter 2, how Satan again comes before God, and I'm not going to read it all again, but he comes and then God says, all right, now you can touch Job. Now you can do, but you can't take his life. Do you think that Job had any idea what was going on in the background? Do you think that Job had any comprehension that God was using him to do an in-your-face Satan? You ain't as powerful as you think you are? Consider my servant Job. But here, Job now not only lost everything, now he's losing his health. Boils on his body. Have you ever had sores so bad on your body you just want to scrape them? You know when a sore begins to heal and stuff, how it begins to itch? You get a little scab and the first thing you want to do is pick it. Can you imagine being covered with boils? I can't. I don't like being uncomfortable. And I, all I can see here is Job being very uncomfortable. In verse 9 of chapter 2, poor Job's wife gets a lot of flack. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, I'll agree she had the wrong concept, but one thing you have to understand, she's going through the exact same thing Job's going through. Except for the fact right now, she doesn't have the boils on her body. And everybody takes things a little differently. But I like the question she asks, you still hold fast to your integrity? Church, what kind of integrity do we have? What does the world see in us when they see us going through struggles and trials and times in which things aren't quite going right? Do they see us cursing God and wanting to die? Do they see us still praising God and worshiping God and trusting God? What does the world see? 
But then in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You see, Job understood that there were things that needed to be done. You know, the hedge that we speak about here, there are a few different areas in the scripture. In Psalms chapter 34, in verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So, maybe your hedge at this time in your life is an angel of the Lord. You know, this is just a side note. This is not something that I had in my notes, but it just clicked in my brain. Did you know that angels never die? The angels that God created beginning of time, they're still alive. They haven't died. You know, when you're going through your fiery furnace, and you're going through that struggle and that trial in your life. Who's to say God doesn't say, okay, you, you angel here, whatever his name is. Gabriel, Michael, whatever, whichever angel it might be. You are with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You understand what's going on. Go down, help Brother Metz. Get in camp around about his life. You know, the, the, the angels that God has, they, they don't die. And their experience, trust me, over the course of time, you know, I had somebody one time give me a sticker to put on my dash of my car. It said, drive no faster than your, your guardian angel can fly. I said, my guardian angel is a speed demon, so I can go as fast as I want. But you see, we need to understand that that hedge of protection, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. Psalm chapter 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and around his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwellings. For you, for he shall give your, his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in your in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone a stone you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me therefore i will deliver him i will set him on high because he has known my name he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and, and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. <clears throat> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Hmm. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. You know... Uh, back in June, my wife and I had the privilege to go to uh, South Carolina and uh, for her son's wedding. And while there, 
we were able to take and <clears throat> go to one of, I think it was Fort Sumter, wasn't it? Fort Sumter. And we're, we were able to tour this old, old fort. Nowadays, one missile would take it out. And, but back during the day and age when it was, it was the fort. It was the one everybody would want to be. I mean, just the way it was constructed and all the weapons of the day. You know, it was a fortress. And you get a, a true feeling when it says that he is my fortress, what a fortress really is. You know, if, if they didn't want you into that fortress, you weren't getting in. And God is the same way. God is not going to let somebody past his walls, past his fortress, to allow you to get to a place that you shouldn't be. Amen. Or that they shouldn't be there for you. Psalms chapter 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hill from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps... You will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the, noon, the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your, your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and even forevermore. God gives you a protection. That we, as the saints of God, need to get a grasp of. We need to get it not only here, but we need to get it up here. God, you have so much for us. You want to move. You want to direct. You want to, to, to bless us in such a way that, God, we are, we can't even begin to imagine. Sometimes I believe we get so wrapped up in... You know, in the things of this world, that we miss out on the blessings of God. I tell you what, the day and age we're living in, I cannot believe how far down our country has fallen in a such a short period of time. And I'm not going to be making political statements tonight, but church, I do believe you need to vote. That's all I'm going to say. But I'm going to tell you this. You need to know who you're voting for. And who you're voting against. Did I say that was it? That's it. Okay, that's it. But you see, the world in which we live in, we can get so wrapped up in the evil and the sin and the, the degradation that even our country is going through. That we can begin to lose track of who's really in control. Ultimately, God's in control. And you know, I've heard it said all my life, Jesus is coming soon. I've heard my dad say all my life, I believe he's coming before I die. But you know what? I tend to right now believe everything he said. I mean, I always, you know, yeah, okay. Okay, Dad. Whatever you say. But as you begin to look at this world and the way it is, you can really begin to see God's moving. Things are happening. Things are beginning to happen over in the Middle East that, that I'll tell you what, oh my goodness, God's just lining things up left and right. Now, I can sit there and I can begin to fret and worry about all that. Or I can say, God, I'm here. I know you're, you're that hedge around me. You're the one that's there for me. And I'm trusting you and I'm believing. I'm believing, God, that you have something for me. Amen. And we need to understand that God wants to do something for us. Amen. 
Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 5 says, For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. God is going to be a wall of fire around about us. And the glory in the midst. You know, we can so easily get sidetracked. But we need to say, God, here I am. I need to hear from you, God. I want to receive from you. God, I want more than anything to feel your power and your might. Amen. Praise God. Second Kings. I don't know, somehow I didn't mark it. Second Kings chapter 6. Amen. Verses 14 through 17. We read about the prophet Elisha. And we read about all the things that are taking place. And, and in this time and how the servant, his servant begins to fret and to worry. And to think, oh, we're going to be wiped out. Because the king has sent all a good portion of his army to get the prophet because... He doesn't like what the prophet is prophesying and doesn't like what's happening. And so if he can silence the prophet, then maybe he's got a, a chance to, to do what he's wanting to do. And so therefore, um, it says in verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Alas, alas, oh master, he's, he's begging. He's, he's worried. You know, that's, that's oh, master, I, I don't know, what, what are we going to do? We're dead men for sure. What shall we do? Verse 16, so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now he's looking at an army that's surrounding the city. Chariots and horses and, and our, you know, men of war. They're, they're, they're surrounding this little city. And yet the prophet, he's, he's not even breaking a sweat. He's like, what are you worried about? Has anybody told you that? What are you worried about? Don't worry about it. It's, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. You know, that eternal optimist. You know, the one that just drives you nuts. You know, the one that would spend his last $5 to buy a money belt because money's going to come some, from somewhere. But the prophet looks at the servant and says, Don't worry. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Verse 17. And, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now that's a hedge of protection. That's more than a little bit of greenery. That's more than just a little shrub that Satan can take a hedge clip or two. You see, that's the kind of a hedge that Satan can't get past. That's the kind of hedge that Satan would sure like to get past. But he can't. Because God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 22 Verses 23 through 31 says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion, tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law. You know... As I was reading this, 
All I could see was our country. Even though this isn't speaking about the United States. But think about this as if you were reading the newspaper. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not dis uh, distinguished between the holy and the unholy, or have they, or, or ha nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining, uh, divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord, God, the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Church, I wonder. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of of the land that I should not destroy it. Is God calling us? Is God calling you? Is God calling me? To begin to build up a hedge around our families, around our church, around this city, this county, a hedge of protection, whatever, however you want to call it and for us to stand in the gap. I believe that hedge is built by prayer and fasting. I believe it takes work. You don't build any walls. I don't care if you are going to go out and just plant a, a hedgerow. It takes work. I don't care if you're going out just to build a, a little knee wall, you know, a little itty-bitty wall. It takes work. Blood, sweat, tears. But if, when it comes to the spiritual church, I believe we as the church of God need to begin to say, God, here I am. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. God, I'm, I'm willing to give up a meal or two or three or four. I don't care how long it takes. God, here I am. I, I, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. You know, we're good. We're real good at saying, God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. God, I, I, I really need this, this, and this. But when was the last time we really gave up something and said, God, here I am. I don't care how long this takes. God, I'm going to get flat on my face in my, my prayer closet, in my room. I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night if that's when you wake me up. I'll get up in the morning. I'll get, you know, I, I'll take time whatever it takes. And I'll begin to search for you. I'll begin to, I'll, I'll, I'll begin to pray a hedge around my children. God, protect my children. God, I, I, I want to see my children saved. God, you know where my children are. And as pastors said many times, you know, those prayers aren't just prayers of kind of like our old now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Just a sweet little prayer. That's a prayer of travail. That's a prayer seeking God. That's a prayer saying, God, I want to know you. I want to see you. I want to see you work. I want to see you work in my life. I want to see you work in my family's life, my children's life. I want to see you work in the church. I want unity to be within the church. I want for God, I, I, I want you to, to move within us. When was the last time we hungered more for God than we did for, for physical food? 
When was the last time that, that we hungered to get more into his word than to watch a, vi you know, a, a TV show or, or play video games or get on Facebook? When was the last time we hungered and thirst, thirsted more for God than the things of this world? I'm not saying that we don't go out and do our jobs. We got jobs to do. We got to make a living. But one thing I've learned over the years, when I go in to do a job, I don't do it. Who, who do you work for, JLL? Yeah. You, JLL gives him a paycheck, but he works for God. The work that we ought to do ought to be as unto God, not as unto that employer or that, that boss that we don't like, the boss that seems to, to, to hate our guts, the one that's always complaining. We work as unto God. And our work ought to show that. I heard of a man that one time worked in the construction field, Brother Leo. He was a young man and he worked with a, an older Christian fella. He said that when they got done laying a brick wall one day, they probably just the course, the, the first course or two, the boss comes around. And starts measuring. And it was like an inch out. From one corner to the other. And he said it was a long wall. But it was an inch off. That boss made him tear it all out. He goes, I figured we could. You can correct an inch in that long. That many feet. However many it was. 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever. We could correct that a little bit somewhere along the line. That boss said no. We're not working just for these people. We're working as unto God. We're going to do it right. We need church to live our lives in such a way that we work as unto God. We need to, to get past ourselves and say, God, I want to do more for you. You know that scripture, stand in the gap? Do you understand that during Bible times and maybe still in the Middle East, when they would take and they, the shepherd would come along, they would have these corrals-like areas. And there would be walls built up. And sometimes they were built of, of brush and, and high walls. And there was only one entrance to that, to that pen, if you want to call it that, that corral. Only one way in. And that's where the shepherd would come and he'd, he'd count the sheep as they went in. And all those sheep would go in. And at the end of the night, he didn't take and grab more brush and other things and stuff it in the hole. At night, the shepherd would lay down and sleep in the gap. The only way that that wolf or lion or bear or whatever would be that would want to get in to get to the sheep, the only way he could do it is to go past the shepherd. When was the last time you were willing to fight for somebody, for their salvation? When was the last time that you were ready to lay down your life as it would be and struggle and fight to protect those that God has put in your charge? Church, we need to understand that God wants to do a great and a mighty work in our lives. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Church, I'm about done. I told you I'd be done by 8.30. Told you I'd be, hope to be done by 8. I missed that one a little bit. But I would encourage you, as saints of God, to not look at some Christian comedian and think, oh boy, he's got a point. Understand that he's, he's a comedian. There's a lot of things I could probably find in the Word of God and 
make a joke about. And I don't think it would be, I believe God's got a sense of humor. I really do. There are some things that I don't think we should joke about. Very much I don't think we should joke about. But I just wanted to bring this forth tonight. God, I don't know what it's going to take. The Lord, I do pray a hedge of protection around my family, around my church, around my city, my county, my state, my country. You know, I heard a preacher not long ago say, I no longer pray, God bless America. But I begin to pray now, America bless God. I'm not going to make all this political. But we as a church need to, in these, I do believe, the end times. We need to start really getting serious about how we're living for God. God, let me, let me see in these last days your power and your might being poured out. God, let your power and might... You know, you, you, God, I want, I, I want revival to start. Greater than Azusa Street. Greater than the day of Pentecost. I want a revival to start. And God, I want it to start right here. Right now. That needs to be all of our prayer. You know, I could have drawn a bunch of circles on the carpet here or taken tape or hula hoops or whatever and laid them out and said, come up and different ones stand in them and begin to pray that prayer. But you can imagine in your mind, just, God, I want revival to start with me. And I'll let me tell you, though, if you pray that prayer, you need to understand things are going to begin to change in your life. Let me also explain this. It won't get easier. Because if you truly begin to pray that, Satan's going to come against you. But as I've already spoken tonight, God as a hedge around about you. How am I to, to say or to know, maybe God sees me as a Job. Oh God, let it be. Sister, go back to Job 1.1. 1, 1. Let it be, God. Amen. There was a man in the land of us. whose name was Job. And that man, blameless, upright, feared God, shunned evil. Church, I'm not going to get into tonight. We could get into blameless. What does it mean to be blameless? To be upright, fearing God and shunning evil. I'll guarantee you we won't be done by 8.30 if we do that. Guaranteed. But I would challenge you to take this verse. And whatever city you live in, there was a man or woman in the city of, my case, Racine, because that's where I live, whose name was Jim. And that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. God, let that be said of me. God, let that be me. And begin to pray to that end. I'll tell you, you're going to go through some struggles. You'll go through some trials. But I want to tell you also, God's going to be there with you. God's going to strengthen you. Because that is the kind of a prayer God loves 
to hear. Trust me, he will not throw you out to dry. And they'll let you go. Amen. Let's all stand. Amen. <clears throat> Maybe there's somebody here tonight that wants to come forward and Maybe you've got some praying to do. This altar is always open. Amen. Is this our prayer? God, I want to change. Lord, I have been so wrapped up in this world that, God, I've been missing the point. God, you've got a purpose for us. Amen. You've got a purpose for me. I may not understand it right now, but God, you've got a purpose. So we're going to just close in prayer. If you want to come and pray up here, this altar is open. If you have to leave, we pray God's blessings upon your life, his protection upon you. Amen. Remember, Youth, Saturday night, the bonfire, Sunday morning. We have <clears throat> Sunday school, morning worship. I'm expecting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us this opportunity tonight, Lord God, to be able to be in your house. God, I pray that you would begin to move and direct within our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to live a life that, Father, would cause us to be said of us that we are blameless, that we are upright, that we fear you, and that we shun evil. God, it is my desire that this church would get beyond pettiness, would get beyond disunity, and God would work toward being unified in thought process, in one mind, in one accord, as they were on the day of Pentecost. That, Lord God, we might be able to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost happen within our city, within our state. God, I pray that a revival would start right here in this church. God, let your spirit move and direct within us. God, if there are those that need to leave already tonight, God, we pray for your protection upon them. But God, I pray right now that you continue to move and direct within us. God, continue to direct. Jesus, move. We thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Continue praying if you like. Amen. God bless.